Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor. Today, I'm so excited because we have Brenda Nickbottle here, and she is a transformational speaker and author. She has authored eight books, and she is currently working on publishing her ninth book that she had co-authored with someone else, and then she's going to talk about that a little bit later on. But right now, she really wants to focus on three things leaders need to improve with their team members to, to increase and to produce member dynamics, to be able to really get their team, you know, together, bonded on one communication level so they could work strongly as a team and really complete their goals and expectations and elevate to new levels. So Brenda, tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. I'm really excited to have you on your show and thank you so much for coming on. This is truly an honor. And uh, so tell everybody a little about yourself. Well, thank, first off, thank you for having me on here. I, I really, really appreciate it. Um, I've been, I am a recovering human resource professional, <laughs> affectionately known as the Grim Reaper. And <laughs> I, help, <laughs> I help business leaders slice through the workplace drama so that they, we can, they can master the people side of their business. And that comes in a lot of different forms. And a lot yes. of the things that I focus specifically on and I'm going to give your your listeners a free gift at the end, if that's okay. Um, I focus on a couple of things. Mm -hmm. And really what we do is I work to help them transform their dynamic and how they are and how they show up. So that way it means working and relating with their team a little bit easier. Because there's a wide variety of personalities, there's a wide variety of beliefs, morals, values. And so the more that the leader can actually work to align those, then everybody's uniqueness, gifts, and talents can continue to drive the team's level of success forward, which just means more work enrichment. It means people feel like they're a part of a collective good and a greater peace. It hits all of those intricate internal bells and whistles that we want, right? <clears throat> that um, not so much working just for the company. It's about really bringing the best out in people so that way when they succeed, everybody wins. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, I, I think it's so important because I think we lack that in a lot of businesses. Yeah. And I think that's where we have a problem. And sometimes I don't even really think that the leaders really recognize these problems. Um, they're so busy because they have so many responsibilities and they have their protocols and they are, you know, they're going by their protocols that they lose track of what's really going on beneath them. And, you know, they, they know what their needs are, but then they don't really know what the needs of the employees are, you know, or the people working for them and things get miscommunicated and they get lost. And, you know, from your perspective, you know, since you are expert in this field, you know, what are some of the problems that you see in today's society when it comes to different businesses, corporations, you know, what do you see that is happening that people really need to really focus and, and understand better so they can help their business or their corporation? Yeah. So one of the things is that, you know, especially in the, in the world of entrepreneurialism, right? So people who start a business in their garage because, you know, they, they have that, that drive, they have that desire, or, you know, they want to raise their hand and they want to take that step up in, in, from being, you know, a power hitter within the organization to actually being a leader. Right. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that most people don't have a good mentor or they don't have a pipeline of leadership education, or it's not yeah. even something that they would think about. It's right. not something that somebody would have told them about to do. And so what they're missing is that they're actually missing that vital education and they're missing that mentorship and they're listening and they're missing out on good examples. And that's what happened to me when I first started. So when I first started, you know, let's face it, I'm a Gen Xer, right? So we mm -hmm. grew up a little different. We grew up, you know, stay outside for 18 hours of the day when school's in summer recess and don't come back yeah. in because, you know, we don't want you inside. You stay out be a kid. You know, we had the garden hose that we drank from and we survived. You know, we were fine. You know, we were playing. We were playing in the woods, making make yeah. sure wherever it was. We were playing in our natural elements and our natural environments. But when it came time for us to sit and learn actually how to how to do our jobs, our very first jobs, you know, we grew up with very direct people. They told us what to do, they told us how to do it, and they prepared us. And so when I had like our first jobs, we sat down, we were told how to do it. And if we didn't like it, there was the door, don't let it hit you on your way out. 
So yeah. it's not that it was toxic. It was just really direct. So it was very directional, right? And yes. so for somebody like me, who's a people pleaser, that just gave me something to push on, right? It's like, right. I knew I had my venture. I knew what was expected. And, you know, we did the job. Yes. What happened is that as that went on, because I was in such a direct environment and there really was no sense about enriching the lives of your employees back then. I mean, yeah. HR didn't even exist back then. It was personnel. Yes, <laughs> you know? it was. Uh -huh. so it's, it's been a progressive, a progressive route. So as I went in, I became very good at executing, which is great because that's what companies need. Companies need thinkers and they need executors and they need people to be both at the same time. Yes. I was mm -hmm. the executor, right? And I got so good to the point where I they would send me into different businesses when I was, uh, or different shops and stores, you know, go, I was the fix it person. I was yeah. the one to go and figure out how things work and fix things because I have a natural gift like we all have. And that was right. to find patterns. So I found where the pattern disruptor was and then I fixed it. And then right. once that gets fixed, then things start falling in line. So I became the fix it person and I was really, really good at it. You know, we yeah. would watch our sales go up. We would, we would see more retention in our employees. The problem was, is that a fix it person isn't the long-term nurturer. And yeah. that wasn't me. So when I would stay in a, in a position or in a, a space or a shop or a project or something, I didn't have that skill set as much as I did the fix it skill set. And so that's where I found that my relationships with the team were starting to erode because I was always in the fix it mood and not in the, okay, today's a new day. We've got it fixed. Now let's move forward. And so yeah. I started feeling like that failure. Right? right. And it wasn't until I was very fortunate to land on a high, a bit hired by a high performing leader and a high performing team and a high performing company. And that leader, man, he worked me up. He helped me <laughs> shave off all of those hard edges. And then that natural gift of finding patterns, I started seeing how the think leaders, I mean, I had some awesome think leaders in this job I was at, man, this day I still am blown away by some of the stuff that I hear. I started watching how they dealt with issues and I started watching how they disarmed people and I started to copy them and emulate them. And if I saw them reading a book in a group, I would grab that book and read it silently at home. You know, I started to pay attention and then I started to try and then I failed. Mm -hmm. And then I started, I did it again and I got better at it. Right? right. So from going from a position where I was good at doing something to feeling like I was failing, I wound up taking myself back down to zero, learning mm -hmm. the skills and, and actually rapidly figuring out uh, how to deal with and then turn around and start teaching other people and helping them figure exactly the same problems that I went through, that they're going through, that I was. So yeah. I was you all back then, right? So yeah. I get it. It's not easy. And I have screwed up more times than I can count. But now I'm, I think I'd like to say that I'm more successful than I am a failure when it comes to this stuff. Probably so, because I wouldn't have a very strong business if I was. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't nearly as good today as I was back then. I'm probably not going to make a lot of, make a lot of money as a business. <laughs> But, um, but that's how it rolls, right? You know, that's the level of mastery and that's how I got started. That's awesome. You know, that's amazing. You know, when, when you see, when you work with people, what are some of the common mistakes that you see going on mm -hmm. in corporations and in businesses that, you know, that uh, there's probably common mistakes that you see repeatedly done throughout. And then yeah. maybe you go over some solutions or some advice, you know, what people could start doing to improve what's going on in their team to make it dynamic. Cause we talked about making it dynamic. So what are some of the problems and solutions that you see on a common base basis? Ab absolutely. And when I work with leaders to build high performing teams, I see exactly the same thing. So you want to start making shifts in your team to go from satisfactory or below standards or below your expectations. There's three things that you absolutely can do. The very first thing is that you need to listen more and talk less. When you mm -hmm. listen more, you learn more. You learn what obstacles your teams face the things that they can't remove because that's your job is to remove those obstacles that they can't do on their own. Right. 
when you listen more, you listen for their behavior, you hear their behaviors. When they're telling you that they're doing this and this is how they're behaving in a situation, you have an opportunity to correct it. You can never adjust and correct attitude. Just stop. Like, don't even try. Because if you try, like if you have a kid, you have a four-year-old kid at home that's screaming their head off, you tell them they have a bad attitude, you all know how great that goes over. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's like a boulder in a puddle. I wouldn't do it, right? Yeah. Um, and then talk, and then when you listen more and you talk less, what you're doing is that you're placing your important, you're getting what you need, all right? But what's happening is that your employees are now starting to build a deeper level of trust within you. You mm -hmm. can trust them because you, they're now like telling you more about what's going on. You're not yeah. going to get T-boned. You're not going to be isolated from information. In addition to that, they actually feel heard. And that's yeah. a key point right there. When people feel like they're being hurt, you're giving them space and you're giving them that stage to tell you what is going on. And you genuinely listen to their concern. You don't have to say anything at this point, right? right. They just feel hurt. That's absolutely massive. So that's yeah. the first thing. And the second thing is that when you ask good questions, you get good answers. So after you got done listening and you start asking your questions, ask questions that are more about the heart of the issue. And that's one of the, that's one of the scripts that I'm going to actually give you. I'm going to cheat and I'm going to tell you what one of them is, is you can ask the question, why do you believe that is the case? Or why do you believe that is, right? right? It's an all around awesome question. It's something that you can use to disarm somebody when they're just kind of going off on a rant, when they're starting to make accusations. It's like it gets to the heart of the matter. And what you're not dealing with is all this extemporaneous stuff that most people deal with. You're not dealing with their, you know, fears. You're not really, well, you kind of are, but what you're not doing is you're not dealing with the drama. And that's why yeah. I say when, I, when you slice through the drama at the workplace, you're actually getting to the heart of the matter. So you're really getting better at your root cause analysis. So then that way, all of this other stuff, like the fray, it's not sucking up your time as a leader, right? Because you have a lot of stuff to do, but you have to still lead and manage your team, okay? Right. And then last is that the power of your leadership will always lie in your follow-up. If yes. you don't follow up with what you say you're going to do or you commit to, one, all you look like is a leader of lip service and nobody likes a leader of lip service, right? They will right. not trust you. They, if you're just like, blah, 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 zero action, that's the only frame that the, your team is going to put you in and they're not going to stay around unless they, you know, people who are really, truly empowered to make something of their life versus those who are, you know, time clock punchers and people who just want yeah. a job, your, your top talent's going to exit in and out faster than the people that are just making stuff happen over and over and over again, right? Oh, so. Wonderful. Yeah. So those are the three things. Your follow-up is absolutely key. Follow up and check in on how they're doing, how this issue went. Um, you make that commitment stands in just your follow-up is absolutely critical. And because if you, if you say you're going to do something and you do it, you're 100% in integrity with that. And right. that means everything to your team. Yeah. I think that's so, you know, so important too. And, and, you know, the drama, especially, I, I hear that all the time, you know, there is so much drama, you yeah. know, people are, are, you know, getting frustrated with this employee, this employee is not doing that, you know, and, you know, this employee is causing me to do their job and it's causing me to do more work and blah, 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 blah. And then all of a sudden the leader of the corporation or the leader of the, of the business, the person in charge is like overwhelmed because yeah. like you said, they have their responsibilities. Now they got to deal with all this drama, you know, yeah. and it seems like you really have to go to the root cause and say, I don't want to hear the drama. What's the problem? Let's figure out the solution. So you really, it seems like you really have to go in there and step your ground and, you know, you have to be not so enabled. It seems like from what you're saying and, and not let, you know, people throw their drama on you. And, you know, and like you said, and back in the day, we were more direct maybe bring a little of that directness in, but in, in, a, in, a, in a polite way, but, you know, say, hey, I don't want to hear the drama. Let's see what the problem is and let's figure out a solution. Yeah, We're absolutely. And, you know, if you ask the wrong questions, you're going to get more drama. You're yeah. only going to get what they think is important. And so that's why these three scripts are so critical is because it actually helps you cut, really cut through all of that. Just get to the absolute heart of the matter. And right. 
and I'll let you in on a little secret. There's actually a bonus script in there too. So there's four. Oh, three. really? <laughs> oh, wow. I think I'm going to go get and download that afterwards. I could use that. Yeah. I think everybody could use that. You know? <laughs> it is extremely helpful. I've been using them for years and at the right time, I mean, you can even use these things on a narcissist and actually get information. That's how strong they are. That's why I love them so much. And I wanted to, you know, give them for free for everybody because they are some of the most impactful things that I've learned how to say. And, you know, listen, if it, if it helps out fantastic, you know, and if it, if it gives you a glimpse into what's going on, you know what, we've got a lot, I got a lot more stuff behind it. So. Right. Yeah. So like, if you had to break it down, like these four tips, these four, you know, th dynamics that can actually bring a team together and bring the leader together with the team, what would you say? Number one is if you had to give like a, a name and a sentence. And so people understand the steps in their head as we're talking. Yeah, I mean, first off, you have to establish a very most important thing before anything happens is that you have to establish a foundation of leadership. You have to. And if you don't invest time in figuring out exactly what that is, then you're not going to go very far, right? Yeah. And that means really understanding what your values are and what are the values that you're going to communicate. And if you're the business leader, what are the values of the organization? And I'm not just talking about mission, vision, and value, just a poster board yeah. statement up on a wall. I'm talking about you know, when you're faced with something, like I'll give you, for instance, like one of my core, my top core value in my, in all of my businesses, because I have five, um, right. is integrity. And we weigh every decision we make against that. So if we, if we're faced with a problem, that's a complex one, because most, most problems are not nearly as complex as we make them out to be. So the question yeah. is, are we going to be integrity if we do it this way? Are we going to be integrity if we make this decision? And are we going to be integrity if we do this? So I'll give you an example. I've got a resale business, right? Mm -hmm. Online resale business. And every listing that we place up, we give we have to give an accurate description. We kind of go a little bit overboard on it. You know, right. we tell them that if something, if we see that something's been altered or if we see that there's a stain on there or whatever, it's like we actually put it in the listing. Now, yes. A while ago, I had, I mean, this is small, but it's such a perfect example. Um, I had somebody that had emailed and said that there was a stain in a particular location on a garment. And so I didn't even go back to the, to the listing to look. I already knew that we listed it, but I was going to go ahead and offer. It's like, just go ahead and return it and we'll go ahead and refund your money. Right. And then right. we'll just gonna go ahead and relist it again and give it to another buyer who, you know, accepts that. Well, right. The platform in which I sold in actually intervened and said, this has been listed accurately. You know, we're not, we're going to decline the complaint. And it was so easy, right? But it's just even something as simple as that. One of my greatest mentors, his family lives by the number one core value in their, in their life is don't let good be the robber of great. So they everything that they do in life, they measure up to that. And that's what core values does. So you have to know what your core values are. And if you start with those two things, set a foundation for your leadership and, and put some homework in and, and really learn what kind of leader that you want to be, get very clear on what your values are, and then you exercise everything that you do from that. That is yeah. an absolute foundation. Everything you do beyond that totally builds on that. That makes sense. You know, I think, I think you have to have a clear understanding of your values, who you are as a leader, and then your, your core values, which you were saying for you, it's integrity, you know, and those are two important things, you know, that you have to establish who you are and who you want to be as a leader. You know, what are your, you know, your integrity, you know, what the co corporations, you know, based upon, you know, these are, these are important things that I don't think a lot of people always give thought to when they go into businesses. They kind of like ignore the, the 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 mission or the 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 values and the and, and you know the core values you know the you know they 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 kind of jump into the business itself and they don't really create that foundation that solid rock foundation of how are they going to build this business you know what are they going to stand for what do they want their consumers or you know to you know to see them as or their clients to see them mm -hmm. as you know and you know. It, I think it's very important that people understand that you have to really show who you are as a company, because yeah. I think a lot of people just dive into the product or service and they don't establish that. And when they don't establish that, like what, you know, real, what negative things do you, that happens to these businesses? Because I think a lot of businesses don't put a lot of emphasis on it. 
That, yeah. And, you know, a lot of employees, too, when they look at their leadership, like back in my fix it management days, I was management, right? I was, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Everybody says, well, you know, it's management. Well, that was me. And yeah. it wasn't until I learned how to start asking people, it's like, okay, so we've got this problem. Does it align with what we say we are in the marketplace? Right. And if you don't have managers that have learned how to do that, or stand up to 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 do that and challenge yeah. the team openly, honestly, without ego. Um, right. You, your employees are only going to see your mission, vision, and values on your wall as just paint. Yes. That's it. And you know the thing is, is that in doing so, you're also setting an expectation so that as a leader, when they come to you, they are coming to you now with a purpose. In other words, they when you when you start reinforcing that. Is okay. So this is our situation. So is this, you know, pull out your values, you know, is, are we integrity with this? Now mm -hmm. what's going to, you start asking them those questions. Eventually what's going to happen is they're going to start coming into and say, Hey, listen, I got a problem and I've been thinking it through and I've got some concerns because I'm not hundred percent sure that we're in integrity with it. If we do this way, you don't even have to lead them at that point. That's yeah. the ultimate goal right there, but it's not going to happen. It's like, you know, when, when people look, I mentioned earlier that when it comes to setting your expectations, doing your follow-up, trust, it builds trust. But here's the thing about trust. Trust never shows up immediately and in mass. It always, yes. it always grows like, you know, rain in a bucket. It, it's yes. one drop at a time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when you can now train your team to come to you in the manner of which that you want them to, in other words, focused in on those core values, they now trust that they can come to you with that problem because they know how you're going to respond. Yeah massive right and they know what to expect they know what to bring to you and mm -hmm. it means that once they bring you what you want you're not going to be you're not going to turn and go critical on them right? right you may challenge them a little bit more and say well have we really fully thought this through or have we taken a look at this right mm -hmm. and so people unless they learn how to do that they don't know how to do it instinctively not i mean yeah. i mean you're talking about like a unicorn that knows how to do it instinctively. No human yeah. knows how to do that for the most part instinctively. They just have to be around it. Yes. No, that's true. A lot of times people don't under always understand. Like when you try to explain things, it doesn't always get across to the person, but when they're in an environment and they're seeing people in action and they're seeing people, how they operate, they can easily start to, you know, conform their, their actions and their behaviors according to the environment that they're in. It's yeah. much easier to see, you know, how things are done and to implicate, you know, to immediately implicate that into their own, you know, actions and personality when they see it right in, in front of them and they see how other people are, are, you know, reacting. That's why it's so important to have a positive, you know, team, because if you have a team that's not showing, you know, um, positivity and it's not amplifying what they're supposed to be doing, a new person coming on is going to be like, no, this is a joke, you know, and yeah. they're going to take things seriously. And, you know, that could be dangerous for the company as well, because we really, when you go into a business, you really want a structured business where people take things seriously they could be friends and they can, you know, have strong, you know, develop strong friendships with one, one another and, you know, acquaintances with one another. But then they have to also realize that this is a business and it has to be done accordingly and take it on a serious note too. You know, yeah. how do you feel about that? I, I I completely agree. And one of the challenges that we are having out in, in the workforce, we have the weirdest job market right now. And we have now for a little while. So yeah. we have, the sands are shifting again generationally, right? So now we've got Gen Z that's in the workforce and they have a different value structure than millennials. They have a different value structure than Gen Xers like me. And mm -hmm. they have a different value structure than baby boomers, which are our supposed to be on their way out, but they can't yet. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's also really weird is that right now we have more positions. We have more people. Avail no, wait a minute. we have more positions available than people. Yeah. Right. So we're in a surplus of opportunity where we are in a demand of individuals. Yes. And that that makes things challenging in and of itself. So if you have a leader that understands their foundation of leadership and everything that they said, it doesn't matter generationally who you mm -hmm. bring into your company. If you are consistently consistent you are yes. going to have a team that thrives. If you are consistently inconsistent, 
you're not. Yeah. And so when, you know, there's this theory that exists out there that you have to lead and manage people differently based off of who they are. I completely disagree with that. You have to lead and manage to what's important, but your approach to the individual, that's a little bit different. Now, here's the cool part. Those impact scripts that I gave you, it doesn't yeah. matter how you approach them. You can approach somebody aggressively, straightforwardly, softly, but if you say exactly the same thing, you're going to get the result that you want. So take that one that I gave you. Why do you think that is, right? If you're in a heated moment, really? Well, then why do you think that is, mm -hmm. right? If you're holding somebody accountable, really? Why do we think that is, right? If you right. have somebody that comes up to you and they're genuinely upset and you're listening, you're like, huh, well, why do you think that is? And if you have somebody that you're training and they're like, well, I'm not 100% sure if this is right. Really? Why do you think that is? It's wow, right? Yeah. And you can use these scripts in so many different ways and you can approach the exact same thing with everybody. And I'll tell you why this is so effective. My old team, one of my old teams that I had years ago, anytime they would come up to me and tell me something that was ridiculous or what I thought was ridiculous, instinctively, yeah. I would I would always say, really? <laughs> <laughs> and they all knew when I hit my limit with their shenanigans yeah, that yeah. the minute I said seriously, and they're like, okay, she's done. <laughs> <laughs> they knew when they crossed the line, because they you, they used to tease me about this. They said, we always knew when we crossed the line, because you would always say, okay, we're not going there. Right. And, and what they learned was that those were the boundaries that I had set. But yeah. I, I was consistent with everybody. And right. some of it, I was joking, but they all knew that when I said it, it was a boundary that I was placing, Right. That's right. a foundation of my leadership. And I'm I like extremely it. consistent with it. Yeah. And I think that's a key too, consistency. You know, some people don't say, you know, leaders don't stay consistent. You know, some some of them are so overwhelmed that they're all over the yes. board. Yes. <laughs> yes, they are. And you know what? Look, it it's not easy being a leader. It really isn't. It is not for the faint of heart. And, you know, I, I relate it to, like employees seem to think that leaders have everything. Well, we have more sometimes, right? But then again, when you're a business owner, you also have less. So you can be yeah. faced with the exact same burdens of leadership uh, as an entrepreneur as you can with somebody who works in a Fortune 500 company. But yeah. if you're getting paid last and your employees are getting paid first and yeah. a leader in a Fortune 500 is getting paid no matter what, you know, right. there's a different dynamic that exists there. And there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. It just is what it is. Yeah. So, you know, those pressures build up. And then all of a sudden we start creating this story in our head. And in it, be, it kind of shapes how we look at the world through a filter. Like it's part of what you would refer to as your worldview, because those were the influences. I get trapped by my influences and my worldview. I just... Yeah have to discipline myself to be able to say, okay, I'm feeling it. I'm under attack right now. What do I need to focus on? Like, what is the most important thing? Because yes. when you, when we lead through our worldview, it's like, I heard this awesome analogy <clears throat> from just an amazing human being that I know. I think he's just an incredible man. And he's like, his analogy was, if you look at a lemon and you put on blue glasses, what's, what's the color of the lemon? Well, some people would say it's green. When yeah. in fact, in reality, the lemon is still yellow. It's just green because of the filter of the lens that you're looking through. Right. right? And so we have to remember that. Yeah. It's very true. Yeah. You know, and, you know, people look at things differently and people have different perspectives. But I think if you put those strong boundaries, like you were mentioning, you know, then you have a structured, you know, um, office or business or corporation and people, you know, no matter what lens they have, they know that, that there's a structure, there's a foundation. This is the way things are done. And no matter what lens you're wearing, this is, this is the standards that their expectations that they're expecting. This is the way it's supposed to get done. If there's a problem, then you could approach, you know, the, your, the, the person who is superior and the person in charge, your leader of that air area, and then figure out a solution together where that communication yep. comes, it seems. Yeah. And I think that the more you get dialed in on who you are, what's important to you, and you you figure out how to rein in your moments, because we don't have bad days, we just have bad moments. 
Yes. Um, what's going to happen is that you're going to be very effective and you're going to surprise yourself one day and you're like, holy crap, I actually did do that. <laughs> Where did that come from? You know? And that's what, and it's happened to me. That's why I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. oh, I, I did it. Wow. Okay. Moving on. Victory. <laughs> Take it. You know. <laughs> uh-huh. Oh, that's so funny. That's so funny. That's now so it, it it is so true. Oh my goodness. So it, it is very true. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Now, if you really like wanted to emphasize on some important things about what you spoke about today, like what are some things you really want to get across to people so they could have a dynamic workforce that they could, you know, elevate to new levels because, you know, people, sometimes they know, okay, this is what I have to do. But the problem is, is that they don't know how to implement it. They don't know where to start. You know, they're kind of confused, you know, yeah. like the is because the, one, a leader is always overwhelmed because, you know, they're a visionary. They're always having a million thoughts of what I have to do now, what I should be doing in the future. You know, what could I do to, you know, make this better? And their mind never stops. But yep. in order to, to begin and to get things under under a, a positive structure, what would you say step one is? Step one is getting clear on what you want and, and get clear on what you want so that way you can start conveying it. Um, you know, teams are brought together because to accomplish things that one person can't do, right? Um, the other thing too is like really take a step back and look at your process and ask yourself this question. First off, what is your what is your company's number one business objective? Because if you don't, if you're not clear on that, like mm -hmm. if you're if you give an, a shallow answer, call, then just say, well, it's to make money. Well, okay, everybody in business is here to make money. If not, it's a hobby, right? Yeah. Um it's like, you know, how do you make a big fortune? You start with the, you, how do you make a fortune? You start with a big one and you lose yeah. it. <laughs> like, what was that? No, I screwed that up. A friend of mine had a dive shop one time and he said, you know how you make a small fortune? I said, how? He says, you start with a big one. <laughs> you, you work your way down. So that doesn't sound very promising. So, no. so, you know, get very clear on what it is that you want. You know, the, the leader that my fate, and he's still to this day, my favorite favorite manager I've ever worked for, favorite mentor I've ever had um, yeah. in the workplace. Like he would, people would run up to him and say, you know, like, well, I have an idea to do this. And usually the people will bring an idea. They'll bring an idea because it's going to help them do their job better, which is fine. But the question yeah. is, is what they want to do. Is it going to help you sell more X? And he would always ask that question. It's like, if we do this, is it going to help us sell more cars? And if yes. the answer is no, then it's not the right thing to pursue. Right. Yeah. So start looking at it that way, you know, start asking yourself, if you are going to do this, is it going to help you do whatever it is? Like, if I'm going to pursue this, is it going to help me get on more stages so I can help more people? And if the answer is right. no, then it's not the right solution. It's yes. not the right direction, right? So start getting very narrow and very focused because we can get overwhelmed. The other thing too, is that if you're a leader that has a lot of controls in place, because you don't feel like you can trust your people, then you're going to need to get, you have to go on a trust journey and you're going to have to start with all of the things that we talked about and then start communicating to your team and work on reaffirming and, and developing those expectations. It is not going to happen overnight. It is yes. going to take time. Yes. It's not going to be on your timeline either, right? Yeah. And it mean, it may mean that you may have to shave off some people. You may have to, like the bus is leaving. You're going to get to a point where the bus is leaving. People are either on it or not, but that's yeah. not the first step. Mm -hmm. That's later down the road. Once you right. start getting some momentum and, and then you learn who's not jumping on your team, who's not really, truly, honestly in and for this, and then start figuring out, Okay. Well, are they still workable? Can they still meet the expectations? And if not, then you know your answer. And it's probably going to be your bottom 10%, yeah. right? And along the way, you have to celebrate. You have to celebrate those wins because if you're making change for the sake of making change, you're going to drive people batty. But if you're yeah. making change for the purpose of achieving something more significant and, and, and you are ushering in a, a brand new era in your business. Yeah. You have to make the celebrations along the way because people need to know what their purpose is and they need to be acknowledged for it. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. I think that, you know, it's so important to reward your team and to acknowledge them and to compliment them for a good work. And, and, you know, I think people really 
um, feed off of that. It helps them. It, it improves their self-esteem. It improves their self-worth. They feel like they're important. They feel like there is a purpose for them in this company, you know, and it, I think it really kind of ignites the, the energy in them to really want to get up and go there. You know, I think yeah. when, you know, when you don't have that, you have a lack of motivation. You know, why am I here? No one, no one acknowledges me. No one appreciates me, you know, and I, I think that's something that I think leaders have to really, you know, think about, you know, what is your thoughts about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And well, and then in my number one live and die rule is in the absence of information, people make stuff up. Like yeah. if you don't, if you don't tell them, they are going to create a story in their head as to why something is. And you know what that sounds like, because you know, somebody that one person who gets really angry, it's like this person, you know, Johnny did this. And I know why Johnny did it because Johnny, you know, Johnny in his head thinks about me in this way. And it's like, yeah, yeah. here you go. Here's the magic of the script. Right. It's like, well, why do you think that is? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know, it's exactly how you do it. Right. Because, it, because the thing is, is that when it comes to not understanding why somebody's doing something, we, we, we don't like ambiguity as human beings. So we have to create a story to fill that void. Yeah, exactly. Right? And that's mm -hmm. what a leader is going to be up against if they do not get out there and set the right expectation, if they don't get out there, communicate and hold, that's the, going back to the core values thing, right? You yeah. know. If it's because we're making the decision because it aligns with our core values, that's the story that therefore gets filled in their head. And now you're not management because that's what management is. That quote unquote yeah. management stories is that that absence of information people make stuff up. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. Now, if you had to take today, everything we talked about today, you know, what are some important things you'd like to emphasize to the listeners? So first off, if you're listening to this and you're in your head going, oh, you know, give yourself, like, give yourself some grace. Okay. You have to give yourself some grace in this area. Um, you know, it is the leadership journey is not a sprint. It is a marathon and yeah. it takes consistent work on yourself. So it's kind of like when it, you remember, like in World War II movies where, you know, the air horn, si like the air raid siren goes on. Well, that was a manually cranking siren, right? They had to get that thing warmed up to, before yep. they were starting to deafen everybody, right? But once <laughs> they had that sound level up, they have to keep cranking, right? You can't stop. Yeah. Otherwise, it comes back down again. Right. So your leadership journey is just like a World War II air, air siren, right? Yes. You mm -hmm. got to get that momentum going. Once you start cranking and keep cranking, everything yeah. starts falling into place the way you want it. And if something's not lining up now, we literally just laid out all the tools for you to start making those shifts and adjustments happen. And it doesn't matter what you're in. You could be in the medical industry. You could be in manufacturing. You could be in construction. You can be in roofing, plumbing, electrical. You could be in data development. You could be in the government contracting section. It doesn't matter. If right. you are in any leadership position, position, not possession, position, all of these things will do the same thing if you implement them. And the biggest thing that you are going to have to wrestle, your biggest grendel is going to be your own ego and punching through those things that, that your own self chatter is limiting. If it doesn't feel comfortable, of course it doesn't, it's change because you're, you're disrupting your own level of mastery. But yes. your level of mastery may not be what's going to get you to the next step. So mm -hmm. you got to you got to punch through that, right? Imagine what life would be like. Everything that you being able to achieve everything that you want. But the yeah. only way to do that is to change the behaviors that aren't working for you today into something that is going to work for you tomorrow. Hundred percent. Oh, that's such a good good advice for the listeners. Yes, hundred percent. Now, what are some of the services that you provide? So one of the services that I do provide, I'm actually in the process of building what's called the leadership survival kit. <laughs> and, it, and it has a full core press of all these different types of things that I'm teaching, right? So different types of courses, like how to deal, how to, how to deal with people who love employees who love to argue and debate everything, how to lead uh, a narcissistic employee. Those yeah. things are all in there. In addition to that, how to actually create an employee avatar. If you don't know what kind of person that you want to bring into your company, you're not going to bring in the right kind of person, right? So we teach you how to do that thing. I teach you how to actually create um, interviews, interview questions and guides. We've got tools for that. How to actually source the right kind of person. 
yes. that you want to put in the seat that's going to take you to the next level. So I have all of those things wrapped up in what's called the leadership toolbox, and it's going to continue to expand. I've got a lot of other bonuses. I've got a lot of other content that I put in there. So like the other day I was at the gym and uh, one of the trainers there like totally blew me off. And in addition to that, she also criticized two of the individuals at the front desk. And if I was a manager, if I was, if, if like that was my business, that person would have been out. Yes. At the very, at the very minimum would have received a, a, a final warning because that's right. not something I would tolerate. I do not tolerate people downing the people that are client facing and helping us generate the right kind of experience. Right. Um, yes. And part of the, one of the people that she was um, knocking down was actually the assistant general manager of the facility. And wow. it's like, that person has full access and you're sitting here telling me that they don't. It's like, girl, you are talking to the wrong audience, right? And I was ticked off about it. So yeah. I made a video about it because that kind of thing drives me batty. That's what kills a business. It's like, you know, a physician's office, like a doctor is not there to be a businessman. A doctor is there to work on trying to get somebody back to full healing or manage whatever condition that they have, right? They heavily rely on the front end of the business. And if that friend in that business is not effective, and if they do that kind of garbage, like I experience with just a physical fitness trainer, their mm -hmm. practice is going to die. Yes. So they need to put a leader in place to make sure that those things happen. And yes. so, you know, that's what the leadership toolbox does. So we've got all of these free videos. We've got, you know, different types of things that I've spoken at some, you know, some podcast interviews like this one will go in right, is a really good example of that um, because we've we've had some really, so I wanna fill it up with a lot of really great content that somebody can go in, they can time collapse because it's very direct, very straightforward, not a lot of extemporaneous flu fa, right? Mm -hmm. It is to the point because our leaders, especially those who are in crisis mode, they yes. don't have time to sit down and invest hours and hours and hours and hours and hours to, to learn something that if they just take a few steps, they can transition like that. They can yeah, transform right. like that. And that's what they need, right? So that's what the leadership survival kit is all about. So I have that. And then we also have the ability for one-on-one -on -one coaching. Also within the uh, leadership survival kit as well is that there's an opportunity to actually get direct access to me in the pocket, in the phone uh, that you carry with you. And that is you can send either a text, an audio, or you can even send a video question and I will respond within a relatively short period of time and kind of give you a little bit of guidance. I also offer um, freestanding coaching as well. <clears throat> kind of depends on what your needs are because I haven't really fully defined it yet, but that's okay. <laughs> it's just something that I'm like, yeah, we'll get back into coaching again. Um, <laughs> you know, it could be instantaneous. It could be long-term, who knows, right? So, you know, those those opportunities are there and that's uh, it all starts with going to my website and I've made it really easy because my last name is not simple. So uh, my business partner, we get on the phone. He says, yo. So I named it yobrenda.com. So <laughs> 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 yo, Brenda. And well, usually what happens when somebody gets on the phone and they have a crisis or a problem with an employee, it always starts with, well, I got a guy. <laughs> <laughs> I got a girl. I got a woman who's, you know, so yo, we just keep things simple here. So yo, Brenda.com. Um, that's where you can actually get the impact scripts. That is the first step in the journey right there. And when you use, because you can use them right away. Right. Well, that's amazing. That's amazing. And you also mentioned that you have a book coming out also. Yeah. So can you tell us a little about that? Yes, absolutely. It's called Mission Ready, uh, Building a High-Performing Team from the Battlefield to the Boardroom. And I wrote it with a friend of mine, the same one that goes, yo, every time we're on the phone. Um, his name is Will Branham. He is a retired Navy SEAL. Um, I do a lot of work in the SEAL communities uh, as they transition. I volunteer about 32 weeks of the year um, helping the transition program at the Honor Foundation as a coach. I've been doing it eight and a half years now, and I absolutely love it. So mm. Will and I got together four years ago, and we started holding each other accountable after we met. I said, because he was about two years out of his, after his retirement, he still hadn't like really narrowed down what the direction was. And so we started doing a weekly accountability call, which has been every week for four years. There's mm -hmm. been very few calls that we haven't made. And 
So Will is on the front part of the book and he talks about like, how do you multitask like a Navy SEAL? What do you do to shoot, move and communicate? He talks, he, so he frames his found, he really sets a foundation for leadership, which is some of the things that I talked about. Right. And so what he sets a foundation and he relates it, he calls it gunfire leadership. <laughs> so he <laughs> takes his experiences of being in combat and translates it into a format that business leaders can adopt. And then once, here's the thing, once you're out there ex executing all of that change and, and getting your foundation in place, guess what? The people stuff shows up. So that's where I come yeah. in. And I talk about, you know, like, again, I said, you guys need to give yourself some grace because really, honestly, the only way through this is to understand your experience and yeah. the only way you're going to get experiences is just engage. Right. Yeah. So um, I help talk about, well, what's a, you know, what is a high performing avatar? Right. So we have, you know, just basically identifying what you want in an employee, but what do you want in a high performing employee or in a high performing yeah. team? I talk about how oh, there's my director of security going. Um, you talk about how change is very dynamic, right? Teams are very dynamic. And that's where the group stuff comes in. We talk about, you know, hiring is like dating. <laughs> oh boy, is it ever, right? And <laughs> how are you going to keep that momentum moving forward? And, and is this individual going to meet your expectations of building a high performing team? So it really, really asks you a lot about what it is that you want. And then we're going to give you, I'm going to give you some tools on um, how to conduct a state interview as well. And the That's... last part of it, I'm going to tell you how to deal with a narcissist, or at least narcissism has no place on a high performing team. I love it. That is amazing. And you've published already. You've authored eight books already. So yeah, that's yeah. amazing. I've been on Amazon's bestseller list two times and we're going for a third one on this one. I love it. I love it. This has been amazing. You know, Thanks. you are truly an accomplished woman. I love what you're doing. You are truly a leader. And, you know, I hope to have you on the show again. You oh, have a to. lot of great advice and it's Thank just, you. it's like, this has been wonderful. I think it's so important in today's workforce, especially with so many different generations and so many different ways of people thinking when you bring them in one community, one, you know, area, you, everybody has to be on the same level. So it's so important that we have people who understand what leadership is, what the duties of leadership is, how to implement it and how to communicate well with the employees, the people working and really get that message out and really be able to work together in unity, no matter what generation you come from. So it, what you're doing is amazing. And I thank you thank so you. much. This has been truly a, a wonderful experience. Thank you so much for being on this show. I really appreciate you. Well, thank you. I appreciate I appreciate you having me on. Thank you so much. And I would love to come back. Oh, I'd love to have you. Thank you so much. This has been great. And you have a great day. <laughs> Thanks. You do the same.